Hey guys, we're slowly climbing out of winter here in Chicago. We had record snow and then bitter cold. Uh, so there really wasn't much going on on Craigslist. Not that I really need any more stuff. I've long past run out of room. But I still look because you never know when some treasure might show up. Now this set I picked up, well, because it was free from that uh, TV radio shop, along with all the other stuff I picked up, all the books and tubes and so on. Plus, it's fairly small as sets go, uh, you know, being portable and so on. But, like I said, I still look uh, on Craigslist, even though I have no space and there hasn't been much listed lately. Uh, but then suddenly this week a lot of stuff popped up. Maybe people were, <laughs> were starting to go stir-crazy and were digging through their attics and basements and finding stuff. Uh, some cool radios. Um, there's one especially cool up on the North Shore, but uh, I think I lost out on that one. And somebody had a combo um, phonograph and record player that uh, matches some of the Admiral TVs I've got. Um, and I, only want, I think they only wanted $20 for it, which is great, but it, it's twice the size of the TV, and I just don't have any kind of room for that. But there was one thing I just couldn't pass up on. It was only a couple miles from my place, and pretty small, and pretty cool, and it's hiding back here. It's another Admiral Portable, portable TV, but this one is only a 10-inch set, whereas this is a 17 it's also a couple years earlier. This is a 58, this is a 56, maybe early 57. Still uh, quite heavy. Nowhere near as heavy as this set, but uh, still pretty hefty. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, a set that I've actually wanted to get for a long time. Several manufacturers made sets that look similar. There was a GE Hot Point that had the two-tone finish. I think RCA had one. Oh, this is the Admiral. Also came in turquoise and white. Yeah, this is the orange and white, which I like better anyways. It's in pretty decent shape. Uh, some paint chips here and there, a little bit of rust, a little bit of wear, and some of the lettering, but uh, nothing unexpected for a set that's 55 years old. Screen's in pretty good shape. I think this stuff will clean off these scuffs here. Is the Admiral name. Controls are all up top here. Channel clunker on a volume, uh, vertical hold, contrast, and the rest are on the back. So you had 10 input, local distance switch, height, linearity, uh, brightness, horizontal hold is this funky bit of plastic coming out here. The cord was really badly deteriorated and one of the sides had already broken off so I just cut the thing off. I'll have to find a cheater cord and drill off these brass plugs to, uh, to get it uh, going. Vent everywhere on this. Every side, top, side, back. And the bottom too. The reason being, check out that power dissipation. 135 watts. That's more than uh, that's more than an amp, which is pretty hefty for a small portable TV. I imagine this thing gets a little bit toasty. Uh, here's the Admiral warranty. Let's see. Admiral Corporation certifies this receiver complies as of date of its manufacture with Federal Communications Commission Rule 15C, whatever that might be. And there's the chassis number. 14YP3B, and the model number is a T102N. Now, believe it or not, with that <laughs> those stacks of the service manuals I got, I do not have this one. Couldn't find one online, so I actually went on eBay and found somebody selling one for about four bucks with free shipping, so I had to order one. Uh, oh well. The owner says that before that cord got too frayed, he did see some uh, signs of life with the set. Of course, I haven't plugged it in yet. I haven't opened it up or done anything with it. But uh, he, he took good care of it. He had a, a little collection of 50s stuff, and uh, he kept it all. Uh, he gave it all a nice home, and he was glad to sell it to me when he found out that I'd actually be restoring it and uh, taking good care of it as well. So, 
first thing up is uh, the, the front and the back come off. I guess there's just a couple screws here. You take the handle off, and then same on the back. And uh, as usual, I want to see if the picture tube is good enough. If it's bad, well, that's kind of a showstopper until I can find a good one. This cool chrome handle was held on with these long Phillips screws. The front panel was held on with these short Phillips screws. And here it is. A little bit rusty on the bottom, but no big deal. And this is plastic, so I'm sure I can buff out all the scratches and blemishes. Not too much trouble. Oddly, though, the back is being held on with these hex nuts, which kind of dug into the paint a bit. I would think that these are more appropriate. These are all kind of rusty though, so I'll look around. I'm sure there's a modern equivalent that will fit and look a lot better. <laughs> when it comes to things like screws, I don't mind using modern replacements on those, especially when they're rusty. Well, this one does actually have a washer on it, but the other one didn't. I'm sure this has been serviced several times over the years, and very common to end up with a mismatched set of screws, half the screws missing, who knows what. Alright, now I need to ponder how this actually comes apart. <laughs> I went digging through my service manuals again, and I did find this set in my Beatman's compendium of most often needed television service info from 1957. And not a whole lot, but I do have the schematic and then this one page description. And it says the cabinet back and front are removable. Remove mounting screws and pull away from the set. And sets with a carrying handle, you have to remove the handle as well. Okay, I got that. Um, and the front came right off, but this back, <laughs> I don't see how. Which seems weird because you'd think to service the screws, you would just want to be able to pop this off. Might just be rusted on pretty solid. But I don't want to force anything, so I think I'll just take off all the screws in the bottom and let the whole chassis should slide out. There was one other bad thing on the bottom here. Uh, two of the feeder are just gone, broken off, just the base stump is left. So I'm sure there were two more feet that look like that. But, in all that junk I picked up recently, uh, there were a bunch of these feet. Now, they're a bit smaller. Uh, but uh, I'm sure putting a couple of these on is certainly better than nothing, and I may just replace these two so all four are the same size. But really, on a portable set, I think you want the front feet to be longer anyway, so it gets a bit of a tilt when you're washing it, so it kind of, you know, points up a bit. But I definitely don't want to leave it like this, because if I set this on anything and slide it a little bit, these steel screws are just going to gouge the heck out of it. These black plastic feet fit on there just perfectly. The old screws fit right in there, mount on just fine. It's so nice when I can use stuff I've got on hand rather than having to order new stuff or try to find old parts online. So, yeah, doesn't wobble at all, awesome. Here's what it looks like without the front mask on. Picture tube looks to be in decent shape from this side. A little crooked. <laughs> But uh, now back to getting the chassis out. After about 15 minutes of struggling, I finally got it apart. It's pretty filthy inside, um, but from what I can see, it's intact. Turns out the back does indeed come off. Once I slid the chassis out the front, I just gave the back a bit of a whack from the inside and it popped out. There's the chassis number and the tube chart and, and so on. But I'm wondering what picture tube it's got in it because it's not marked in that one schematic I've got. Okay, it's a 10 ABP4. Hopefully one of my CRT testers supports that. Don't know if I'm a qualified personnel, but I'm handling it. So, here's the inside of the cabinet. Nice and filthy, but scorched in areas. I assume those get really hot. Put that out of harm's way. Okay. Also, to pop all the knobs off, which was pretty painful, I had to 
kind of dig my, my tips of my fingers under there and yank them off. They're all pretty filthy, but I'm sure a little soaking in some warm dish detergent will take care of that. I have no idea if these recessed numbers were... Well, they must have been filled in with some color. It looks faintly reddish from what I can see. Maybe it was even orange at some point in time. Looks like it got melted here a little bit, or maybe that's just some crap that fell on it. Some like clear nail polish or something. Huh. Anyway, it's, at least I've got all the knobs. That's the important thing. All right, so here's the chassis. So it's filthy. Speaker, a little tiny itty bitty little speaker there. It's got a little patch on it. <laughs> Hopefully, it's still good. Otherwise, it looks like just a permanent magnet speaker. I don't know. Three inches in diameter, maybe two and a half. I'm sure, it'd be easy to find a replacement for it if I needed to. It's pretty filthy and disgusting. Oh, look at these tubes. <laughs> Yuck. All right, flip this around. Put a look at that picture tube. This does actually use circuit boards, very early circuit boards, which I've heard can be a bitch because uh, the material they used wasn't exactly like modern glass epoxy and these tubes would generate heat and a very common problem was the tube bases like this one that are soldered right under the circuit board, well they would, uh, they, the joints would open up. I especially know it's bad in the predictors. This looks okay from what I can see though. I've never worked on a TV that had the tubes mounted on a circuit board. I've encountered plenty of them, especially when I was a kid going out on my bike and garbage picking, but I would just rip the tubes out and whatever other parts I could grab and leave them behind. I never tried to fix one before. I bet this is a lot easier than Predictas though. Um, the problem with Predictas is the way the circuit boards are mounted. Well, they, they, they mount the boards and they hardwire them in with dozens of connections around the periphery. But I bet these, you remove a few connectors and take these bolts out and the circuit ports come out for easy servicing. Well, there's the tuner. And I'm glad this is a big old rotary type tuner. There's another kind where they use the wafer tuner. Where it's just like a little thin deck of uh, a couple wafers of the same type of circuit board material and the coils are soldered right onto that. Those have a, a tendency to, to break or warp over time, but this is a big old-fashioned turret-type tuner, which takes up a lot of space in here. But uh, they are fairly reliable. Must be a tube into the shield. I wonder why it's got a cardboard tube on it. Seems a little unusual. The yeah, others have metal tubes over them. Maybe that's insulation so it wouldn't rub against the cabinet. All right, so let's see. This does not look like an Admiral tube. It's something like National Video Corporation is a label on there. Which could be a good thing if it was been replaced. Maybe it was replaced not too long before it was uh, retired and it's got a lot of life left. Only one way to find out. There we go. All right, I will pull out my Sencor. Hopefully, I've got the adapter for that. Otherwise, I got another tester I can try. It turns out that you don't use one of these adapter sockets when testing the CRT with the Sencor CR70. Rather, you use their universal adapter, which is a bunch of alligator clips. So I've got all those hooked up. I've got the settings set. Uh, let's see, and here we go. First thing you do is set the filament so it's on that red mark there. Picture tube is glowing, which is always delightful to see. Now, Check for HK shorts, good. G1 shorts, good. If 
for the next test I need to let this warm up a little bit so I'm going to pause the camera okay I've had the tube warming up for about 15 minutes so let's move on next up I want to check the cutoff the idea is you should be able to rotate this control and have the meter move which kind of simulates a video signal uh, modulating the grid on the picture tube and you want to be able to get into the black box region which is a normal operating region there and then you check the emissions and yeah, they measure pretty good which is awesome last test is life test uh, you push this button it cuts some of the juice to the filament and if it's a really good cathode this needle shouldn't move much so let's see I push it right now yeah. It's dropping a bit. I've seen worse. I've seen better. But it still should have plenty of life to produce a good picture for a while. Okay, so the set is definitely worth restoring. I just spent a little time with a soft brush and some compressed air and some Windex and cleaned off the worst of the gunk from the top area here. Uh, so, uh, a few other things to check. Uh, there's a flyback inside here. There's a cute little trap door contraption on the back here. Pop open, and there is a little flyback in there. Kind of hard to see. And there's a little rectifier tube up above it. I don't quite get this door though, because it just bumps into this capacitor here. So, unless you take the circuit board, I don't see how it opens because this hinge doesn't really come out but from what I can see it's uh, looks to be in decent condition it's not all uh, cracked and nasty like the uh, the one the other Admiral portable set was so I think that's it for tonight I really just wanted to gate to, to gauge the, uh, the condition of the picture too because uh, I have to finish the Philco 60 and then I've got other projects and obligations I've got to take care of and work's been kind of hectic lately but uh, rest assured I will get to this sooner or later. That's all for now. Okay, I admit curiosity got the better part of me so what I ended up doing Instead of putting this set back in its cabinet and putting it on the shelf while I went back to my radio projects, I spent some time uh, getting it running again. Uh, primarily what I did was I plugged it into an isolation transformer and Variac, a dim bulb tester, and my Variac has a fuse of about 1.5 amps, which is appropriate for a set of this wattage. And I slowly, over the course of about uh, two hours, increase the voltage. The idea is that you want to slowly recondition or reform these electrolytic capacitors. Because it's possible they might have some life left. How much? Who knows? But if you slowly bring the voltage back up on them, they can um, kind of revive a bit. Uh, if they don't, they'll actually get hot. So you want to make sure that the cans are not getting hot, that the set isn't drawing too much current. I also checked all the tubes, and they're all okay. And the last thing to be worried about, really, in a set like this, is the selenium rectifiers. There's one on this side, one on the other. I have had sets where these have gone up in smoke. The smell is horrific. It will take days or weeks to get that smell out of both your home and just your mind is really really bad so these have got to go and be replaced with modern silicon diodes but like I said curiosity got to me I haven't had a TV running in a while but working on radio so much lately so uh, the first thing I got was our local low power FM station Let's see if I can get it back up on here Well, I gotta hook up a pair of rabbit ears back up and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, here's that local station I was talking about over the rabbit ears. And 
So that was the first thing I got. The, the set is extremely touchy. Although it seems to be working. The horizontal hold, the brightness, the contrast are all extremely touchy. The picture shifted over to the side. So I'm sure I've got to clean the controls. I'm sure there are some capacitors that are leaky and resistors that are drifted out of tolerance. But it is playing. There is a picture, there is sound. And here it is back with the converter box, and I think you can see how jittery it is. And if I touch any of these controls, the picture gets really freaky, and the brightness control is the worst of all. Where the picture just goes from complete brightness to kind of normal. And it feels really loose too, so probably needs to be replaced. Now if you're gonna if you've got the itch to fool around with a set like this where there's no power transformer, please invest the money in an isolation transformer. Because this is running directly off the AC line, no power transformer. If you touch the wrong points, you can very easily electrocute yourself. Also, a variac is a very good idea because you can control how much AC voltage goes into the set because it's running directly off the line. If I turn this up or down, I can cut down how much power is going into it, which is what allowed me to slowly, slowly coax it back to life. Now, <laughs> this is a ticking time bomb. These caps and these selenium rectifiers are going to fail. Plus, this stuff doesn't work very well now anyway, so I will definitely do a full resto on this. I just wanted to uh, give you guys an idea of what this set might look like. Plus, of course, I was curious myself. <laughs> uh, and that is really all for tonight.